It's November 11, 2000, and winter sports are in full swing at the picturesque Alpine village of Caprun. The 9 a.m. funicular train is carrying 161 passengers up the steep track to the slopes of the Kitsteinhorn Mountain. After just a few hundred yards, the train disappears into the tunnel leading up to the summit station. It's a trip that shouldn't take longer than 10 minutes, but the train car doesn't arrive. Instead, the power goes out and the connection with the conductor is lost. Now, there is no way to find out what's happening in the tunnel. About 20 minutes later, clouds of thick black smoke are billowing out of the tunnel's upper end into the Alpine Center Station. Something inside is on fire. If it's the train, all the passengers and the conductor are cut off deep in the heart of the mountain. A trap that's almost impossible to escape. Ultimately, only 12 passengers defied their instincts to escape the Caprun fire disaster. They avoided a tragedy that nobody saw coming, caused by a seemingly incidental, deadly detail. The possibility of a fire breaking out in the tunnel was close to zero. There has never been an accident like this on any Austrian cableway. After all, there was nothing in the tunnel or the funicular to incite the blaze. The Gletscherbahn funicular had no engine, fuel tanks, or other parts of a standard railway. Using steel cables, two trains traveling in opposite directions are hauled by a powerful motorized winch system. Austria has over 20 of these railways, including Gletscherbahn Caprun II, which was built in 1974 and modernized in 1993. The single track was 4,265 yards long, of which 3,600 yards were in the tunnel. As one train ascends, the other descends on the same track bypassing each other at the passing loop. Each of the two trains comprised two carriages with eight compartments accommodating up to 180 passengers. Two cabins were positioned on either side for conductors responsible for opening and closing the doors. Most of the people inside the train that day were frequent guests of the Caprun Ski Resort and had ridden the funicular many times before. Because of this, none of them suspected the train would break down, let alone catch a light this ride would shatter their assurances. Thomas Krauss, a passenger in the rearmost compartment, was the first to notice something fishy was going on. After only 65 feet up the track, he saw the control dashboard smoking in the empty conductor's cabin behind him. As the train kept ascending, the smoke became more intense. It then appeared in the passenger compartment, making people nervous. As the train entered the tunnel, the anxiety in the compartment turned into a panic. A fire was about to break out. Caught by hysteria, the passengers started banging on the compartment walls. There was no way to alert the conductor in the cabin on the other end of the train. The funicular was not equipped with fire alarms, intercom systems, or emergency brakes. Unfortunately, there was no way the conductor could have heard these calls for help. One passenger tried to use his mobile phone to call the service station there was no signal inside the tunnel. The train kept going up the tracks and deeper into the unlit tunnel. As feared, the fire broke out and spread across the vacant conductor's cabin at the back. Then, four minutes after leaving the station and 650 yards inside the tunnel, the train suddenly stopped. The passengers presumed the conductor was aware of the fire, thinking he had stopped the train to evacuate, but this was not the case. The doors wouldn't open. Still unaware of the blaze, the conductor was confused about the train coming to a halt. He didn't do it, nor did his colleagues at the Alpine Center on the summit. The spreading fire burned the lines of the hydraulic brake system, which engaged the brakes automatically. Paradoxically, the system designed to prevent disasters had put the passengers into a deadly trap. They were inside the burning train in the middle of a 3,600 yards long tunnel. With the doors still closed and smoke taking over, passengers inside the rearmost compartment started to look for a way out. Despite all the effort, there was no way to open the doors. Erwin Getz, a builder, started hitting windows with his ski pole in an attempt to break them. An almost impossible feat as the windows were made of brake-resistant acrylic material. It was a race against time as the fire began to break into the compartment. 
Gates was hitting as hard as he could and finally managed to make a crack in the window. The relief lasted only for a second as Gates discovered another layer of acrylic glass behind the broken one. The fight continued. Several passengers had already passed out after inhaling toxic smoke. Eventually, the window broke and people started to escape the burning train. After four minutes, the conductor finally realized what had happened and contacted the service station for help. He was instructed to open all doors immediately and let the passengers escape. After the message, the connection was lost. Further complicating matters, the hydraulic system for opening the doors also failed. As much as the conductor kept trying, the doors would not open. The smoke was entering the rest of the compartments, and it was just a matter of time before the fire engulfed the whole train. Luckily, the conductor was calm enough to leave his cabin and engage the door's manual lock. He managed to open all the doors allowing the people to leave the train. It was a moment of relief for all the passengers as they escaped the flaming train in the nick of time. For a moment, it seemed disaster was avoided, and it would have been if passengers hadn't made one deadly mistake. In the pitch black darkness and with their ski shoes on, the passengers tried to move away from the fire, so they climbed uphill. As they struggled to move through the tunnel, they didn't notice that all the smoke was going in the same direction. Caproon Tunnel's 30 degrees steep angle created a chimney effect, which caused all the heat and smoke to travel upwards. None of the passengers who went up the tracks survived. The cloud of smoke was too thick, and the concentration of carbon monoxide was too high. Nobody could reach the end of the tunnel that was almost 3,000 yards away. The majority suffocated within 50 feet of the train. Only a group of 12 passengers from the rearmost compartment managed to escape the inferno. It was a stroke of sheer luck that among them was volunteer firefighter Thorsten Gradler, who had enough experience to know they had to go down past the fire. He shouted at the other passengers, I know fireplaces, and when you open the flue, the fire shoots upwards, so you have to go down. Hold each other's hands. Believe me, we have to go down. With Gradler leading them, 12 passengers passed the burning conductor's cabin and reached the smoke-free zone below the train. They were forced to walk slowly because of the weight of the ski boots. Despite escaping death in smoke and flames, the group's agony did not end. They had to cross 650 yards of the track inside the tunnel. With the fire raging, there was the risk that the haulage cable might snap and send the train down on them. Luckily, it didn't happen, and the group reached the lower end of the tunnel. They were saved. The remaining 150 people, including the conductor, died from suffocation from heading upwards in the tunnel. Sadly, the death toll increased by five more people. Inside the twin train that was coming from the opposite direction were two people, a conductor and a passenger. They, too, failed to escape from the smoke and died of suffocation. The smoke spread fast and it spread far. Ultimately, it reached the Alpen Center at the summit, where the staff tried to recover the power. When they noticed the smoke coming from the tunnel, they raised the alarm inside the station and adjacent shopping mall. In a rush to save their lives, the employees left the emergency door wide open, increasing the chimney effect in the tunnel. It flared the fire in the tunnel and brought more smoke into the station. By then, the service station down at Caproon had alerted local firefighters. In half an hour, 500 firefighters, 22 helicopters, and 100 rescue vehicles arrived at the scene. Helicopters transported firefighters to the summit, where they rushed into the station to rescue anyone still inside. Four staff members were left inside after the evacuation, unconscious from smoke inhalation. Although the firefighters managed to take them all out, it was too late for three of them. The train was fully engulfed in flames by the time responders arrived. There was no chance of getting to the other side. The firefighters abandoned the rescue effort due to the risk of the haulage cable snapping and sending the train back down the track. A total of 155 people died, including children. Most of the casualties were tourists from Austria and Germany. Others were from Japan, the United States, Slovenia, the Netherlands, the UK, and the Czech Republic. 
Among the victims were world champion freestyle skier Sandra Schmidt and seven-time Deaf Olympic medalist Joseph Schauper. The nation was eager to find out how it happened, especially because the responsible claimed such a thing was impossible. So, what caused the fire? The answer is rather bizarre. Just four days after the accident, the examining judge of the Salzburg court had appointed an expert, Anton Muir, to investigate it. The Ministry of Interior had also sent a unit from the KTZ Forensic Center to investigate the fire scene. Unfortunately, the subject of the investigation had burned entirely, leaving no traces behind. Therefore, the twin train was used to determine the source of the fire. Investigators based their research on the testimony of Thomas Krauss, who claimed the smoke came from the dashboard of the conductor's cabin at the rear end of the train. In general, funiculars are built without parts that could cause a fire, no engines nor fuel tanks. Upon inspection, it was determined that the only item that could have caused the fire was a cabin space heater. As it turned out, no one had considered that such a seemingly irrelevant installation could end up burning down the entire train. The heater became the center of further investigation, since both trains had the same heater installed. The one from the twin train was removed and taken to KTZ Laboratories in Vienna. The investigators discovered that the heater's heating element was the fire's most likely source. They believed that it came loose, made contact with the plastic housing, and ignited it. The fire slowly spread, fed by flammable materials inside the desk. It ate into the lines of the 42 U.S. gallon hydraulic system, which eventually burst. The released oil and rubber flooring fueled the blaze that spread across the cabin and later the entire train. The controversial fan was installed in 1993 when the funicular was subjected to modernization. Salzburg public prosecutor Ava Danninger Soriat used reports filed by both Muir and the KTZ team to build the indictment against 16 people. Three managers from Gletscherbahn and Caprun AG, the company in charge of the funicular. Two managing directors of the Austrian Swoboda, Karasori and Stalba GmbH the business that carried out the modernization work and installed the fan heaters in 1993. Three employees of the German Mannesmann Rexroth AG who installed the hydraulic lines. Three officials from the Ministry of Transport who had issued the railway operating license. Two inspectors from the TÜV Technical Inspection Association who approved the train. And two technicians and a builder who installed the emergency door at the Alpine Center. The public prosecutor was determined to find the culprits for the 155 lives lost in the most devastating peacetime tragedy in Austrian history. The trial started on June 18, 2002. The prosecutor claimed the accused had made a series of oversights in designing and inspecting the train. The key argument was that the fan heater, Fakir Hobby TLB, was intended for home use, and the manual explicitly stated it was not to be used in vehicles. Therefore, the fan shouldn't have been installed in the first place. The proximity of hydraulic lines only increased the likelihood of fire. In addition, no security features were present on the funicular. The entire design was a major oversight. The prosecutor put the reputation of the Austrian cable traffic system and the entire tourist industry at stake. It was a bold challenge to the system. The lengthy process was marked by a lot of controversies. In 2009, the German news reported on the alleged manipulation of the process by the Ministry of Interior and Salzburg Court. The focus was put on the report and the treatment of the expert, Anton Muir, who was appointed by the examining judge, Manfred Seiss. For instance, when he arrived at the scene of the investigation, Muir was denied access to the tunnel. When he finally entered it, investigators from the KTZ Center had already taken away the evidence. Muir only received the fan heater in March 2001, four months after the accident. On top of everything, the Salzburg court utterly neglected a 54-page report filed by the expert. In his report, Muir noted traces of hydraulic oil in the heater housing. He also found traces of the insulating mineral wool that the Gletscherbahn technicians had used to stuff the cavities between the built-in wooden panels. Finally, 
Muir was the one who stressed the proximity of hydraulic lines as an essential factor in the breakout of the fire. During the trial, the defense attorneys were allowed to make persistent attacks on Muir, which affected his mental health. At one point, the court found out that the expert had seen a psychiatrist and ordered his psychiatric examination. Since he had been diagnosed with a pronounced depressive syndrome, the court dismissed Muir. According to news sources, the expert said, It's so dirty in court, I can't stand it any longer. With Muir eliminated, the rest of the experts still engaged in the process and played down the findings of his report. On February 19, 2004, after almost two years, the turbulent process came to an end. In contrast, Judge Manfred Seiss's shocking verdict opened a whole new chapter of the story. It was found that the disputed heater had necessary safety marks and was installed following legal standards of the time. Neither Swoboda nor the employees who set up the hydraulic lines were aware of its installation. The investigation also found that no oil leaked from the hydraulic system. The train itself was inspected according to schedule, and the Alpine Center's emergency door worked as specified. As such, there were, quote, no indications or concerns that funicular railways could be dangerous in terms of fire protection. All 16 defendants were acquitted of charges. The verdict shocked the prosecutor, victims' families, and the Austrian public. 155 people died, and no one was to be blamed. The way Judge Seiss saw it, quote, God turned off the light in the tunnel for a few minutes. The accident couldn't have been foreseen, as nothing similar had ever happened before. And that was it. Case closed. Then Gletcherbahn and Caprun AG directors made a mistake that cast doubt. It seemed that the entire trial was an orchestrated cover-up. Upon receiving an acquittal, Gletcherbahn and Caprun AG's management filed a lawsuit against the disputed heaters manufacturers, the German company Fakir. However, what they didn't count on was that the prosecutor's office in Salzburg would hand the case over to their colleagues in Germany. So, in November 2005, the Heilbronn Public Prosecutor's Office took over and asked the KTI Forensic Institute of the State Criminal Investigation Office in Stuttgart to renew the investigation. They were determined to do a thorough job. The first thing they did was to request a fan heater from the twin train to be delivered for examination. When they received it, they noticed a fastening dome on the heating element that allegedly let loose was missing. It was only the beginning of a series of shocking discoveries by German investigators. After that, the truth began to unravel. Next, they revealed that the heater was disassembled before the installation. The front and the rear part of the heater were taken apart, mounted on a hole in the control panel, and fastened back together. This meant that the safety test mark was no longer valid and that the heater housing was violated and lost protection from liquid dropping in. Further, the following discovery brought a whole new light to the Caprun disaster. While observing the heater, German investigators found red liquid residue inside. In the Salzburg court verdict, the judge assumed this was only a reddish condensation. However, the investigators wanted to make more than just an assumption so they sent a sample of the liquid to the laboratory. The result? The red liquid was hydraulic oil, highly flammable hydraulic oil, that has been banned in aircraft construction for years due to the risk of fire. This clue led to a conclusion that the hydraulic lines were leaking and that the flammable oil was dripping inside the heater housing. It then came in contact with the heating element and started a fire. But what about the report claiming the heating element let loose and set the plastic rear wall of the heater on fire? In support of the claim, investigators from the Austrian KTZ Forensic Center delivered a fan of the twin train with the heating element bent and touching the rear wall. German investigators were rigorous in their research, though. According to Austrian investigators' photographs from immediately after the accident, the heating element was intact and a safe distance from the plastic black wall. They concluded that during the inspection, someone had manipulated the heating element by bending it toward the rear wall of the housing. Based on all the evidence, the German investigators dropped the case against Fakir. 
They further noted that, as claimed by the Austrian court verdict, the fire, quote, could hardly have happened. On the other hand, a fire could break out if there was hydraulic oil inside the fan heater. They also accused their Austrian colleagues from the KTZ Center of being sloppy in the investigation, and even worse, of manipulating the evidence. The German inspectors were determined not to let the whole thing pass so easily. So in 2008, they filed charges against four Austrian experts for manipulation of evidence. Ava Denninger Soriad, the prosecutor who filed the initial charges in 2001, wanted to take the case, but the Ministry of Justice declared her biased. Finally, in the spring of 2009, it was taken over by the Linz office, whose prosecutor carried out a lukewarm questioning of accused experts. After four months of coordinating the decision with the responsible ministry, the Linz prosecutor discontinued all four procedures. The state of Austria and the Gletscher Bonn Caprun AG seemed to have bailed out. They never recognized the blame for the Caprun disaster. Instead, they tried to ease the anger of the bereaved families with insurance compensation totaling 13.9 million euros. Eighty of them, however, are still intent on going as far as possible to find the culprit for the deaths of their relatives. In the wake of the accident, the government passed a series of regulations to improve passenger safety in cable railway systems. Austria was about to meet the standards that France and Switzerland had established 12 years before the Caprun incident. The Caprun tunnel was sealed after the tragedy. The tracks and both stations were removed. Today, a memorial at the site is a reminder of a tragedy that could have been avoided. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.